Hey, my name is Caden, and I want to thank you for joining us today. We hope this message inspires you, builds your faith, and gives you perspective to see God is moving in your life. Enjoy the message. Well, greetings, everyone. My name is Ron Watts, one of the pastors here. And I just have to say, it has just been a privilege to be part of this worship service uh, this weekend, to send teachers, to send our educators into this year uh, with, with some inspiration. And talk about inspiring. That is one inspirational view. Uh, the footage that you just saw is from uh, National Geographic. They equipped, they got a, a specially equipped a drone, high altitude drone, and went to the Himalayan mountains and captured some of the most stunning footage you'll ever see of Mount Everest. Uh, someone last year gave me a gift of uh, subscription to National Geographic, so the old magazine, and, and it came with a big fold-out uh, picture, one of the most stunning pictures I've seen. Actually, it, it, it took my breath away watch, just seeing that picture. Can't always say that happens with a photo, but it was stunning, the imagery of Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain above sea level. And um, friends... I gotta say, we're going to the mountaintop with this scripture, with this uh, topic, because uh, we're going to see some breathtaking views from the teachings of Jesus that call us to an extraordinary life. We're continuing this series called Extraordinary and like I said, we're going to the mountain peaks. We're not gonna be hiking in the foothills in this message, friends. We're gonna be looking at some of the most breathtaking teaching, calling us to a whole different kind of life. And um, what we're gonna see here is that, Jesus, is that the mountain Jesus bids us to is impossible to climb. Yet, it is breathtaking in its view, in its beauty. And so, um, but before we get to that breathtaking view, before we get to that teaching of Jesus that is simply unparalleled and unlike anything that's ever been given, we gotta start in the foothills. We gotta start with something that uh, I'm gonna call the ordinary way because it is so typical of the world in which we live. And it comes to us from the passage you heard earlier from Luke chapter nine. And uh, we'll pick up with, with verse 53. It says, well, here, let me, give you, let me give you the background first. Jesus is with his disciples and they are getting ready to go south to Jerusalem. They're up in the Galilee. And the most direct line is through Samaria, but Jews and Samaritans did not like each other. There was hatred that existed for centuries between these two groups. And so Jews would often walk all the way around Samaria because to go through there was a bit dangerous. Samaritans didn't want them to come through and just to avoid that territory. But Jesus goes about life in a whole different way. And he is going to go right through Samaria. And he sends an advance team out to get one of the villages ready, okay? Now we get to the verse and it says, but the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, brothers, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Oh my, James and John. We think that it was shortly after this that Jesus gives these two guys, these two brothers, a nickname. He calls them sons of thunder. <laughs> they had a little bit of an anger issue and they were not afraid of confrontation. In fact, they, were, they, had that, they had a big old chip on their shoulder and they were ready for a fight. And so this village says, no thanks. The rabbi and his teachers and his students, they can't come through here. <laughs> and so the disciples, I guess they think they're gonna earn brownie points with Jesus for this. I don't know what they're thinking, but they turn to him and they say, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven? I call that the ordinary way because isn't that how our world operates? We operate under a kind of a, a law of retaliation and hatred. You hurt me, I'm gonna hurt you worse. You don't let me stay in your village? Okay, we're gonna burn your village down. Isn't that how our world operates? 
so much animosity. Animosity, wherever you go in the world, you'll find it between different groups. If you are different from me, I suspect you, I, I'm suspicious of you, and I may not like you. In fact, I may hate you. That's the ordinary way. It says in verse 55, but Jesus turned and rebuked them. Luke, who's the only one that tells us this story, doesn't say what Jesus said. I really would like to know what Jesus said. Did he say, cut it out, guys, or did he really just give it to them? I don't know, but interestingly, the word rebuke is the same word that is used in the gospels when Jesus rebukes demons. Friends, when we live out the common, ordinary way of retaliation and vengeance and hatred of our enemies, it's demonic. And Jesus calls it out. And he rebukes these disciples. Friends, that's the ordinary way. You see it everywhere. You, every time you open the newspaper, it's there. When you watch the news, the, the ordinary way of people hating one another and retaliating, taking vengeance is everywhere. But Jesus shows us a better way. I'm gonna call his way the contrarian way. You know what a contrarian is? A contrarian is, we think of that as a negative term, like someone who's critical about something. It can be, but a contrarian is someone who says, you've been doing it this way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce you to a whole different way of doing it. And usually when the contrarian speaks, it's, it's a way, it's an approach that we've never thought of before. And you say, huh, I never saw that before. And that's exactly what Jesus does. And here is when we go to the mountaintops, because this teaching from the Sermon on the Mount is unparalleled in philosophy. It's unparalleled in religious teaching and any religion in the world. It is stunning. It is the highest ethic ever given. Let's look at this, Matthew 5. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, the Old Testament didn't say that. The Old Testament did say, love your neighbor. But some began to interpret neighbor very narrowly. Like neighbor was just the people like me, the people that I agreed with, the people that I loved. And so they would then kind of a tradition arose in the religious community that, yeah, you can hate your enemy, but you just got to love your neighbor. Jesus said, you've heard that. But I tell you, verse 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. In other words, if you do this, there's gonna be a strong family resemblance. You're gonna look like your father. Why? He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Our God is a God of love. Our God is indiscriminate in how he showers his love upon the world. And the good and the evil and everybody gets that blessing. And so Jesus says, if you'll love like that, if you'll love with an indiscriminate kind of love, even towards your enemies, you will resemble your father in heaven. Then he says, he chides him a bit. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? They hated tax collectors. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Kind of update, update that a little bit. Don't even terrorists love their own? Members of the mafia, they love each other. Folks at Antifa, uh, Nazi, neo-Nazi skinheads, they love their own. Big deal. Jesus says, you're not to be like that. Your love is to be a different kind of love that is as broad and indiscriminate as the love of God. And friends, this is the contrarian way. 
This had never been taught before, to love your enemies, to pray for those who persecute you, to pray for those who hurt you, to pray for those who come against you. Never been heard before. In fact, this teaching is so radical. This ethic is so counterintuitive, countercultural. It is so subversive that a lot of people read this and they say, ah, it's impossible. Jesus didn't really mean that actually. And there's some theologians down through the ages who have said, interpreted this and said, yeah, th this wasn't really meant for, for this world. Jesus is giving an ethic for the kingdom of heaven. But in the kingdom of heaven, you wouldn't have enemies. That doesn't make sense. The whole Sermon on the Mount is given for the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God is among you, Jesus says. Friends, this is for here, right here, right now. It's the mountaintop, I, told, I tell you. I've had people, I've had conversations with folks. Say, you know, if, if you lived out this ethic in business, you, 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 you'd go under. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, Ron. Come on. I've had people tell me in politics, you couldn't operate this way in politics. If you did, you would get run over. Is it amazing how easily we dismiss the radical teachings of Jesus and we just don't want to believe that they apply to our lives, but friends, they do. They do. Because it's been tried. And there have been others who, there have been others who've walked in this way and when they walk in this way, it's downright inspiring tell you about a guy named Howard Lynn. He was uh, 21 years old in 1944, and he was from Iowa and was stationed in, um, in Europe during World War II. And he was on a bombing mission in a B-24 Liberator bomber, flying out of an air base in England, heading towards a city in Germany uh, for a bombing raid when the plane that he's riding in gets um, a fire, enemy fire shot and begins to go down and he and the pilot have to parachute out and they're in German territory behind enemy lines. German troops see his parachute, they pursue him all evening, he's able to evade them through the evening and the next day as he's kind of eluded his captors, he finds his way to a quaint little German village and finds us a family and they're, they're having breakfast and they see him and they invite him in and they feed him breakfast. But the 15-year-old son in the family finds a German policeman and turns Howard Lynn into the police. He's taken as a POW and he's part of a PLW group that is made to march for 87 consecutive days. Very little sleep, very little food, no showers, no care. And a number of men die on this terrible march. And for the next year, Howard Lynn is a POW. The camp gets liberated. He makes his way back to Iowa. He meets his sweetheart. They get married. He's um, living this life. And in 1994, a friend of his who was in his unit has a son and he's doing some historical research and he goes, digs in some records and he, he finds a guy by the name of Wilfried Breerman. He was that 15-year-old young German who turned Howard in. They wrote a letter to each other. Wilfried invited him to Germany. And he says, they brought us to their home and then they took us out to a restaurant and they treated us like royalty. And at that meal, this man, as they, these two get together uh, for dinner, admits that all these years he's carried with him this terrible guilt he said, we knew that, that we couldn't hide you. We knew that we couldn't protect you and, and yet we had to turn you in. And Howard did something remarkable, extraordinary. He looked at him and said, you know, it's okay. I, it was wartime. You had to do what you did. 
I forgive you. And that began this beautiful relationship between these two men that lasted until uh, Wilfred died. And last month, on July 31st, 2020, Howard Lynn, at the age of 97, married 74 years to his wife, died. He was a follower of Jesus. He was part of the greatest generation. The greatest generation, yes, who defeated Nazi Germany and Japan and also went back and rebuilt those countries, turned them into great democracies. Who does that? There is a different way. It's the contrarian way. And when we see it, when we actually see it lived out, it's the extraordinary way. Well, I want to read a passage, another passage that kind of takes us to the mountaintops. It's, uh, it's 1 John, and it's uh, 1 John chapter 3. I'd like to, to read this for you. And then John writes this. He says, for this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, he was the original son of thunder, you might remember, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we've passed from death to life. How? Because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Interesting words, isn't it? Coming from the son of thunder who wanted to incinerate an entire village. And now, he's a different man. That nickname that Jesus gave John, son of thunder, stayed with him for a little bit, but over time, it just kind of faded away. And John, who was a teenager when he was following Jesus, would live the longest of all of the apostles. He would outlive the other apostles by decades, well into his 90s. And he became known as the apostle of love. The son of of thunder becomes the apostle of love. How's that happen? He tells us. He says in verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. What transformed this angry, vengeful, get him back kind of guy, this son of thunder and made him the apostle of love. It's very simple. He spent time with Jesus. And I'm not just talking about the three years in his ministry. I'm talking about the intervening decades because it was John in his teaching who tells us that that Jesus taught that, that I'm the vine and you're the branches. Everyone who abides in me bears much fruit. And what is the fruit that God wants to see in our lives? It's love. You see, John, the son of thunder, stayed in very close contact with Jesus. And it transformed him. And he became the apostle of love. When he was on his deathbed, he's in his 90s, his Uh, Church family is around him. Some of the elders of the church are there. And they said, John, would you share one last word? You're the last remaining eyewitness of Jesus' ministry on earth. Give us a word. Tell us something deep, John. Tell us something great. Tell us something profound, John. And he looks at him and says, little children love one another. And his eyes close and he grows silent. And they say, well, John, is there something more? (laughs) And John's last words is, no, that is enough. And he breathed his last. 
What's enough? Little children love one another. Not bad for a guy who needed to go to anger management school. <laughs> Not bad for a guy who wanted to incinerate an entire village all because they didn't let Jesus and them stay there for the night. Amazing, the transforming power of Jesus who not only taught this but lived it, who prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He prayed for those who persecuted him. He loved them. How do we do this? So kind of a, a new way. John discovers this new way of living, laying down your life for one another. And we see it here in another mountain peak in the New Testament. When Paul writes in Romans 12, he, he writes about love and action. And he gets to, at the very end of the chapter and he says this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Extraordinary. Mountaintop. Again, the ordinary way is someone is evil towards you, you're evil even more so back towards them. But here he says, no, 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 no. When you see evil, what you do is you overcome it with good. Just counterintuitive. Who would have thought? It's a new way. It's a glorious way. It's the way of Jesus. And when you see it done, it's stunning. You know, one of the things that stands out to me, that sticks out to me of seeing the power of overcoming evil with good happened in a movie, of all things. 14 years ago, 2006, a movie came out. And get this, not only is a movie, it was a movie that Clint Eastwood starred in. It was the last movie that uh, he acted in and directed, Gran Torino. If you haven't seen that movie, you need to see it. I was gonna show you some clips, but we have to beep so much out of, uh, out of it, it just kind of wasn't worth it in there, kids watching. <laughs> it's, 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 it's um, I mean, the, the language in there can, you know, peel the wallpaper off of the wall, but, but let me tell you something. The story that it tells and the, the powerful demonstration of overcoming evil with good is unforgettable. So Clint Eastwood plays the role of Walt Kowalski. Walt is a surly, bigoted, angry, stubborn veteran of the Korean War. And he lives in a, in a neighborhood, a middle-class neighborhood that has been colonized by Asian immigrants and he resents it. The whole neighborhood has been taken over by Asians and he's 78 years old. His wife has just died and his best friend live next door, sells his house and Asians move in three generations of them and he wants absolutely nothing to do with them. But circumstances conspire against Walt. He ends up involved in their lives and, their, and they in his life. Beyond all reckoning, he becomes kind of a father to the young man at the house next door, a young man who tried to steal his Gran Torino, a young man that uh, he absolutely hated. And he kind of becomes a father figure as they spend time with each other. Um, this Tao is his name. He has a sister named Sue. And um, Walt just kind of takes them in in his old gruff, surly kind of way. Then a horrific thing happens. There's a gang that terrorizes the neighborhood, a gang of um, folks in the Asian community. And it's, and it's a horrific situation and it's a, it's a frightening situation and they brutally gang rape Sue. And Walt, he just can't handle what he's seen. He just can't handle it and he burns with a holy rage. And this is at the point of the movie, okay? He's already pulled out his gun a couple times, you know? And this is where you're thinking, this is where Clint Eastwood goes all dirty hairy, right? He, he's gonna get his gun. He's gonna go hunt down these members of the gang and it's gonna be vengeance time. He's gonna take them on one by one, right? Well, Walt comes up with a plan 
but it's not the plan you expect. Tal Sue's brother is just absolutely incensed that he's a real peace-loving guy, but he wants to go, he wants to get blood, he wants to take vengeance. And Walt knows he's a bit too much of a hothead at this time, and so he locks Tal in his basement, and he goes out to face them alone. In the evening, he goes to the front lawn where, the, where five members of this gang live, and he calls them out of the house, and they come with their weapons. And also neighbors begin coming on their porches and they're watching this little standoff. And, 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 and there's Walt standing there with five gang members in their guns. And you're thinking, how is he gonna get out of this? How, how is Clint Eastwood gonna, gonna save the day here? He reaches into his pocket and they get kind of nervous. He pulls out a cigarette. And he says, do you have a light? And he says, I have one. And he reaches into his coat and pulls his hand out quickly. And the gang members, they think that he's got a gun and they riddle his body with bullets. And Walt Kowalski falls to the ground, the perfect form of a cross. And the camera zooms in and from his wrist, you see blood trickling And in his hand, you see a cigarette lighter. Walt didn't go with the weapon. He was unarmed. And all the neighbors witnessed this murder. And the next scene, the police show up. They put him in cuffs. And they take this gang away. And by Walt laying down his life, he brings peace to his friends, he brings peace to the neighborhood. Again, it's not what you expected. It's a contrarian kind of movie, a contrarian kind of way. It's the way of Jesus. Now, Obviously, it's a Hollywood movie. It's over-dramatized. You and I will probably never be in any kind of situation like that. But you know what? Every single day, you and I are in situations where we have the option. We have the choice in front of us with people who are rude to us, with people who insult us, with people who hurt our feelings, with people who sometimes do really bad things. How are we going to respond? How are we going to interact? We're going to take vengeance. We're going to be like John and James, sons of thunder. That's so ordinary. Or we're going to take the extraordinary path. Sometimes what the life of of faith and this kind of loving means is laying down your life in little increments, dying to certain things and letting other things go. It means meeting cowardice with courage. It means meeting anger with gentleness. It means meeting bitterness with tenderness. It means meeting stinginess with generosity. That's the extraordinary way that Jesus calls us to walk in. You say, I can't do that. You're right. Remember what I said? The mountain Jesus bids us to is impossible to climb. It's impossible for you on your own to climb. But love can do this through you. A couple weeks when we wrap up this series, we're gonna look at Paul's amazing chapter called the love chapter. And he says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self seeking. Notice he doesn't say you. He doesn't say the Christian is this way. He says love is this way. Love through you, love in you can do the impossible, can live out this incredible ethic, can love even our enemies. Um, And how do we get this? We get it by spending time with the one who is love. 
We get it by being with Jesus, just like John, who went from being a son of thunder to the apostle of love. It was because he hung out with Jesus. He abided in Jesus. After Jesus died, resurrected, and and ascended into heaven, John just soaked up the presence of Jesus. When you hang out with Jesus, you're going to be given a new power and a new kind of love. In this series, we've been saying, give me five. You know, many of you may, don't have an opportunity to serve right now within the church building, but there are ways you can serve. Let me, here, can I suggest some things you can do with this message, with these verses of scripture? First, I would encourage you to spend time with Jesus. How's your prayer life these days? How's your time in the word? How's your time in, in, in worship alone? And soon we'll be back in the building, but we have this online experience. We have other ways where we can draw near to God. Have you been drawing near to God? Because when you do, you'll be given a power that's greater than yourself. I want to invite you, here, here's a, a thing you can do. Pray for your adversaries. Make a list of people who get on your nerves. Make a list of people who bother you. Teachers, it may be the students, you know, after being with them for an hour this coming week, you're gonna say, I need to pray for them. Here's the deal. You can't hate somebody and pray for them simultaneously. You start praying for folks who've hurt you, who've wounded you, it'll change your perspective. Forgive someone who's hurt you. And then maybe consider some way to do something good for them that they don't even know about. Do it in secrecy. And if you do, you'll walk in this extraordinary way. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, you, love itself, and because you are in us, you can give us a love that never fails. Oh, Jesus, make us like you. Make us like you so that we might be perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect in love and grace and goodness. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed today's message, make sure to like and subscribe. Feel free to share this with others that God has put on your heart. And to learn more about LaCroix Church or to find your next steps, head to lacroixchurch.org. Thanks again for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon.